going to start the recording now. Our presentation tonight is the ways in which butterflies fly. Our speaker tonight is John Acorn, and he is a biologist and naturalist, and he teaches at the University of Alberta. He has been a long um, lifelong resident of Edmonton, and he is best known for his television series, Acorn, The Nature Net. <laughs> Just the name is delightful. And he is also the author of some 20 books on natural history subjects. Uh, so thank you, John, for being with us tonight. Well, thank, thank you. It's, it's really nice to, uh, to talk to this group. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I know some of you, uh, I, I should say right now, it's just, it's just so great to see your face, Bob. I, I haven't seen you for years, so glad, glad you're doing well. Um, I'll, I'll also, because I know this is being recorded, I'm going to say hi to, to Caitlin as well. Uh, I hope she'll be able to watch it later. Uh, I'm, I'm missing out right now on, on, a, on a, uh, a Zoom session for the Alberta Lepidopterist Guild, but they send their regards as well. They're having a riveting discussion of specimen label formatting. So, uh, so uh, I don't know. Don't, 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 don't go looking for that link. I, I, I'm going to try to keep you uh, uh, interested here. But yeah, I'm, let, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen. And, and I just, I just want to tell you about some, uh, some work that I've been doing um, having to do with butterfly flight. And, uh, and I'm going I'm to call it the ways in which butterflies fly, uh, butterfly flight modes. Um, and, and what we know about them and 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 and, uh, and and what we can what we can uh, what we can say at this point in time so um and, and there's there's i don't have a, a publication on this topic yet i'm i'm working on it i've got a, you know a draft and every time i i uh, i i come back to the topic i think well i've really got to get that published but let's let's instead of starting with butterflies, let's start with birds because a lot of attention has been given to the way that that birds fly, and um, and and part of the 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 result there is to realize that uh, you know many of the things that I'm sure most of us learned in some class somewhere in our past are actually not exactly true. Like this this typical diagram of of the uh, of the way that an aerofoil shape works to to create lift with the uh, with the air taking a longer path over top the wing than below and therefore because it's going a longer distance it goes faster and therefore fan faster moving air has lower pressure so you get low pressure above the wing and, and high pressure below the wing and then the then the whole wing goes up well that's that's great in theory but Apparently, that's not the way it actually works. In, in, in reality, the, the aerodynamics people, and you know, I'm thinking here about, uh, about people with, a, with an engineering background, um, they tell us that, no, nah, you know, when we actually do the measurements, things like the angle of attack of the wing, like how steeply it's pitched into the, into the wind, that's much more important for, for generating the, um, for generating the lift and and as you know as people interested in, in lepidoptera that's kind of good news because as as you know there's there's not really a there's kind of vaguely an airfoil shape with the way the wing the wing veins are are uh, you know articulating or pardon me uh, uh, um, alternating up and down more or less but not really and uh, anyway you can you can you can see the the angle of attack clearly in this uh, great gray owl, one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite birds. The other thing that's uh, that's quite apparent uh, from studies with birds is is that the importance of of vortices. So as a bird is is flying through the air, whether it's gliding or flapping or whatever uh, flight style it's it's exhibiting at the time. Uh, there, there are, are vortices that are, that are generated along both the leading edge of the wing and, uh, and at the wing tips. And those vortices, you know, it's not at all like that diagram I just showed you. It's not the, the air smoothly flowing over the wing. It's the air 
starting to, to, to spiral over the wing. The result of that is, uh, is to create what we call drag. So, so anything that, that it's kind of the equivalent of friction as, as, a, as a flying animal moves through the air, it experiences lift and it experiences drag, which is the friction uh, component, that what, the, the component that slows it down, let's say. And, and it also experiences thrust from the, uh, from the flapping. So, uh, so you've got these two vortices on the, on the wings of a, uh, of a bird. And, and you've got equivalent vortices on the, on the wings of a butterfly. And the little inset diagram there shows, uh, shows the wing tip vortices coming off, um, off the wings of a couple of diagrammatic butterflies. Here's, here's that, uh, that same owl coming to rest on a, uh, on a fence post. And I really like this picture because it shows the vortices, but I have to explain how it shows the vortices. You, you, you see how the, the, the feathers, the small feathers, you know, we call them uh, coverts, the coverts along the, the leading edge of, of the wing are, are ruffled and they're ruffled by the vortices. The, the, the feathers on the back, the mantle of the owl are ruffled by the, uh, by the vortices. Uh, you don't see that even if you take, you know, detailed photographs of butterflies in flight because the scales don't quite uh, ruffle up the same way bird feathers do, but those vortices are, are, are still there. So, so, but there's so much to, 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 uh, to know about butterfly flight, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in the aerodynamics here, um, but I will tell you one thing that, that you know, even, um, you know, people in aerodynamics sometimes forget, and that is butterflies fly in the flying position. They don't fly in the position in which we see them in museum collections. So, so uh, up at the top, there's, there's a nice little um, uh, graphium from, from Asia, a swallowtail, and the wingtips are pretty well as far separate from one another as possible. And, and the, the, the leading edge of the, of the four wings is, is almost uh, perpendicular to the body. And it's such a different position from the, from the museum position where you try to, to get that uh, trailing edge of the forewing perpendicular to the body. Um, I, I, I've, I have a whole cabinet full of butterfly specimens. This may horrify some of you, and I, I'm a, I'll apologize in advance if it does. I have a whole cabinet mounted in the flying position, which is often the basking position as well. Um, I, I, I've come to quite like it. And, and for one thing, you know, you, you get a sense of, of what the, the wing patterns look like you know, on, on a living butterfly, what they look like to other butterflies and to presumably to potential predators and, and, and so on. Uh, to me, the, the wing pattern on this, this species looks so much nicer in the flying position than it does in the museum position where the, uh, where the bands are, are kind of uh, disarticulated in a sense. I, I've really taken an interest in butterflies with oddball uh, wing shapes. And, and here's, uh, here's a specimen of a, of a very strange thing called Pseudopontia paradoxa. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to, I think it's African. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a Pierre, it's a white, right? And, and pseudopontia, meaning the false pontia. Pontia is the, is the genus for our Western whites and, and, and checkered whites. Uh, the reason I show you this is to, to start telling uh, a few things about wing loading. And, and when we talk about you know, the, 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 uh, the factors that affect flying animals, even airplanes, anything that flies, Wing loading is a big factor, and it's it's a pretty easy thing to calculate. It's the mass of the of the flying uh, critter um, uh, over the wing area. It's extremely easy now with with uh, image analysis software that's you know free online. I use something called ImageJ. It's really easy to calculate wing area uh, from 
from specimens or, or, or carefully done photographs. And look at this butterfly. I mean, the mass of the body, and, and you know, when I do this, I, I do it with the, with the dry weight, and, and not just dry weight, but Edmonton, Alberta dry weight in the winter, which is extraordinarily dry. Like there's no moisture left in that butterfly, I guarantee it. Um, that butterfly has almost no mass. It's all got almost no body. I don't think there's another butterfly on the planet. I could be wrong. Tell me if you know of one with a smaller body compared to its, to its wing area than this one. So there's, there's an example of extremely low wing loading. I, I, I've never seen one of these in, in, in person. Uh, I've, never, I've never been to the continent of Africa. Uh, but I would love to see one fly. And I imagine that it must fly kind of the way that, you know, if you, if you throw a Kleenex into the air, how it flies. It's, it, it can't have much control uh, at all. And it must fly in the, in the most still air situations. I, at least that's what, what my imagination tells me. Here, here's, uh, here's something on the other end of the scale as far as wing loading. Um, and, and I believe you, you've got these where you live as well, uh, the, the silver spotted skippers, uh, Apergyrus claris. So a very, um, a very heavy body, a very large body for the, uh, for the size of the butterfly. And when you, uh, when you do the calculations, you realize that this thing is, uh, is you know, I mean, it's just kind of, it, it reminds you of the old story of, of how, uh, how the, uh, the silly scientists who thought they knew everything were able, able to prove that bumblebees could not fly. Um, I'm sure that the same uh, mistaken calculations would come to the conclusion that these things can't fly. Um, why, why, where did that story come from? This is kind of an aside, but uh, I'm prone to that. It, it came from, from the fact that they used the, the uh, the model for, for an airplane, for something with an engine. Bumblebees don't have an engine, they flap. Flapping flight is fundamentally quite different than, um, than engine powered flight. But anyway, you, you, you get the idea. You've got some butterflies with very heavy bodies and relatively small wings, some but butterflies with very tiny bodies and, uh, and relatively large wings. And then you've got a whole bunch of, of, uh, of butterflies somewhere uh, in between. Now, there's another measure that um, that aerodynamics people really like, and that's called aspect ratio. And uh, it's, again, it's a it's a pretty easy thing to calculate. You take the wingspan and you square it. You multiply it by itself, and then you divide that into the wing uh, area. And so here's uh, another African butterfly. Papilio antimachus. I'm not sure if that thing is still in the genus Papilio, but but uh, you get the idea. It's a it's just a remarkable looking butterfly, and it's got a high high aspect ratio. You can you can visualize this uh, the 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 black box around the butterfly here is the wingspan squared, quite literally. And so this, you know, this, this ratio is just a matter of how much of that box is filled in by the, by the butterfly itself and how much of it is, is negative space. Um, I'll show you in a second that this particular butterfly is extraordinary in this respect. There, there is, oh, there's a very nice online video uh, I think there are actually two online videos of these butterflies in flight um, in, uh, in the southern, uh, southern part of Africa. I think South Africa in particular, but I, I can't remember. Uh, and they are very, very fast. They, they, they're, they're powerful flyers. They, they, uh, they're, they're really quite remarkable to watch. They, they, they remind you of, um, uh, I don't know, may, maybe a nighthawk or, or some, uh, you know, a bird like that with very long, narrow wings. Um, uh, I don't know, I, I, I watched the, the videos and I'm, I'm, I think of boomerangs. They don't actually fly like a boomerang. That's completely wrong. But for some reason, I have this boomerang sense when I watch them. 
Of course, the, you know, the bird wing butterflies of, of Asia also have elongate, um, elongate wings and, uh, and a, uh, a very high aspect ratio. Um, we don't have an awful lot of high aspect ratio butterflies in, uh, in Western uh, North America. We don't. There, there are a few moths that, uh, that almost uh, achieve this kind of aspect ratio, but most of our butterflies uh, uh, don't. It's interesting to me that the bird wings, this of course is, is a male um, of, uh, well, it's Trogonoptera. I can't remember which one of the, the uh, I think there's only two species. But, and here's, here's a, a female Ornithoptera. Uh, and and the, the females have quite a different aspect ratio than the males, which, you know, you, you, you wonder if that affects their, their flight style, their behavior, their, um, uh, their ability to get around. The bird wings are extremely interesting. Um, but again, you know, I've, I've, I haven't personally had the opportunity to see, to see bird wings fly, except in a few butterfly greenhouses, which uh, I, I'll admit I've, I've made good use of. I, I really enjoy butterfly greenhouses. Now, now here's here's a morpho, here's morpho pilates, and uh, and you can see at a glance that that the butterfly fills an awful lot more proportionately of the uh, of the wingspan squared box. So um, so this uh, this butterfly has has uh, has a very different aspect ratio. And if we threw that uh, pseudopontia in here, it, it would it would be even uh, even more so. If you if you graph the two together, you get something like this. So so on the uh, uh, the uh, the horizontal um, axis, you've got wing loading with low to the left and and uh, and high to the right. On the uh, vertical aspect, you've got aspect ratio with low at the bottom and high to the top. And there's uh, there's the I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, good. So there's Pontia down in the in this corner, and it's and it's and it's low on both. Most butterflies, you know, I, I've scored eighty some species so far myself. Most butterflies show up in this part of the graph where this graphium uh, swallowtail is. Then you get into the the bird wings, and the bird wings actually cover quite a spectrum up toward the upper right corner. And there's that Papilio antimachus, uh, clearly an outlier, like a very strange butterfly that is structured uh, quite unlike any other butterfly, at least that, that I've had a look at. So, uh, you know, eventually I'll have a more detailed graph for this, but that's the general pattern. And, and I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I, I can kind of imagine how these things might differ in their flight styles. But, uh, you know, there's, there's even more to it than that. And I get a kick out of this. Uh, I hope you like this, Bob. You know, it's all about words. Th these, are, these are the words that I've been able to gather from various uh, uh, publications, mostly field guides, but, but including others, for the, you know, the styles that butterflies use to fly. Um, and, and look at them all. I, I won't read them all, but you can uh, just enjoy them as, as we go here. Fascinating. Do, are there that many different ways that butterflies fly? Or could we group them together in, 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 uh, in other ways? Or are there more for that matter? I, I, uh, I find this quite, uh, quite a fun little exercise. And I'm, if you know of any other terms, please, uh, please let me know. I'd, I'd love to add them to the list. Okay, so let's go back to that, to that morpho. Um, I want to show you a video uh, uh, recorded at a, a butterfly greenhouse. The University of Alberta, where I live, has a, a butterfly greenhouse, and, uh, and they let me in before the, the public comes in in the in the morning and uh, 
and I, and I took a video camera that allowed me to do slow motion. So, so I'll show you a, a, a live one in flight. Oh, and I'll also explain in case uh, some of you don't know this, that um, in museum specimens of morphos, they typically remove the abdomens for the males because the, uh, the, uh, the oils, the lipids in the abdomen can spread onto the wing and, 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 and reduce the iridescence and ruin the beautiful blue colors. That's why this butterfly has no abdomen. All right, well, here's, here's our morpho. So it's coming along and, uh, and the, uh, the butterfly keeper is, is spraying the plants with a hose. So the morpho is a little bit, a little bit freaked out by the hose. But you can see that this butterfly is I mean, it's very effortful. Flight for this butterfly takes a lot of work. And the body is pitching up and down with the wing beats. The, the, uh, it's, almost, um, it's almost unbelievable that the little tiny body of that butterfly can, can move those wings uh, the way it does. But on the other hand, you know, it's, it's, it's managing some nice maneuverability. Let's watch it again. It comes in, there's a little bit of a glide here, and I'll come back to the subject of glides in a moment. And then I think it starts getting the, the water drops and that's when, when, it, um, when it puts a little more energy into uh, figuring out how to get out of the spray and into a better situation. I just love watching these slow motion videos. Now I'm not saying this is the most beautiful slow motion video you'll ever see, it's not. <clears throat> but there's a lot you can learn just by slowing things down. Um, the, the, um, I, I, I don't know if, if any of you have seen a, a wild morpho in, in, the, in the neotropics, but it's just such an incredible sight. You know, typically down, down a, uh, uh, the course of a stream or, or along a road in a rainforest setting, and you, you just see these incredible flashes of blue and then the butterfly kind of disappears when that brownish underwing uh, uh, shows up. And then the blue comes back, usually in a, in a slightly different place than you imagine it's, it's going to. It must be very difficult for birds to follow that flashing iridescence that, that, uh, that appears and disappears. At least there's some, um, uh, there are some scientific papers that suggest that that's one of the possible functions of iridescent color, especially for animals that are in, in dappled light forest situations, flying through, you know, you get into a beam of light and then, and then the iridescent disappears in the shade and then it's bright again. And, and, and birds may have a lot of trouble following that. But morphos make it even more difficult with their flight style. Anyway, beautiful thing, just beautiful. Uh, how, how do we how do we get slow motion? Just a, a quick review, and I'm I, I'm I'm using an ancient uh, movie camera to demonstrate. Just because this is not a new technique, you you basically slow things down by recording more frames per second than uh, than you use to view the video. So here's an old movie camera that the normal viewing speed is 16 frames per second, but you can crank it up to 48 frames per second. And if you divide, um, uh, or pardon me, 64 frames per second, if you divide uh, one by the other, you get four times slower than normal. The video that I'm showing you is generally um, uh, 10 times slower than normal because the video camera I'm using is, is capable of, um, of about 250 uh, or 240, I should say, frames per second and I can play back at, uh, at 24 frames per second. It's, there, there are unbelievable videos online of slow motion butterfly flight because so many smartphones can now do even more than that. There's, there are lots of smartphones that can, uh, that can shoot video at uh, 900 and some frames per second. So, <clears throat> you know, that's remarkable. It was not that long ago that anything that could shoot that many frames per second was like a research grade instrument. Um, I think this is a very exciting time for, for naturalists 
because all of a sudden we have this technology available and we can go back and look at these butterflies that uh, you know that we we thought we knew and 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 we can see things that we didn't see before so so let's let's do some of that here's um uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell most of you what this is. That's a clouded sulfur butterfly. And you probably have lot of, lots of them where, where you live. Uh, Coleus philodesi or, or uh, Eryphaly, uh, depending on your preferences. But uh, what, what, you know, where does it fall in the graph? It falls right in that, that sort of central uh, spot where, where the wing loading and the aspect ratio are, are, uh, are fairly, fairly average. Here it is in the flight position, and, and now let's watch one in flight. So, pretty straightforward. Now, quite different from the morpho, don't you think? I mean, the, the, the flight is much more powerful. You, you, can, you can just see that it's achieving a, a higher relative speed, you know, more body lengths per second or however you want to measure it. More importantly though, the butterfly is continually flapping. It, this is a sustained flapping flight. Um, the, the, most of the literature that I've read on, on you know, in, in the engineering sphere on butterfly aerodynamics, they, they tend to, to assume that this is how butterflies fly because you can, you can model a, a sustained flap a lot more easily than you can model some of the other flight styles that I'm, I'm showing you. But there's, there's an example of a butterfly that just simply keeps on flapping. There's not much else happening except flapping. Now, it's, it is able to change direction, and, and, it, and it's got pretty fine control on, on what it's doing, and I'm not going to show you, you know, what they look like when they're taking off or landing, but they're, you know, you know this already, that they're, they're pretty... Uh, they're pretty much in control of what they're doing while they're while they're in the air. And of course, you know, I, I should also say, I'll just let, me let this play while while I ramble for a bit here. I should also say that <clears throat> there's there's a fairly widely accepted classification for flight mode styles among birds, and and that you know sustained flapping flight is is one of the well-known flight mode styles around, among birds. I actually got interested in, in this subject, talking to, uh, to bird people. Uh, I, I didn't know about their classification of flight modes and, until, uh, until that conversation. And I thought, well, I wonder if anyone's done this for butterflies. And the answer is not really. There are some uh, comparative studies, but they, they've, uh, they haven't really explored it the way that uh, you know the way that a naturalist would want to explore it okay so i'm so i've, I've got a i've got a pause here and i'm not even sure how 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 i'm doing for time but i, I assume i'm doing all right are, are there any questions so far yes there are um the first question um is uh, one i was also um interested in the issue of pinning the butterflies in their flight position and Allison Center comments that she agrees with seeing um, seeing butterflies in their natural positions, especially now that she's looking for bumblebees. She's been fooled more than once by the little forester moths flying toward her with the red spots looking like pollen bags. So that, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that, um, that it could be so different. Um, can you um, recall exactly what prompted you to start on that path? Oh, just just the realization that 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 some of those color patterns were lining up so nicely in the flight position, and and that they looked so so uh, so disarticulated in the museum position. And I don't want to say anything bad about the museum position. I I understand completely how you want to see, you know, all all the all the characters on the wings on on a museum specimen <clears throat> for taxonomic work and for identification purposes, but. To me, it's just really, um, really fascinating to, to see the, the butterfly in, in the in the uh, in the actual flight position. And it would, you know, it would be it would be, it would be fun to to you know pin the forester moths in the in the in the same way if, if you're you're the sort of person who makes a collection or you know what do what do uh, you know 
be mimicking scarab beetles look like in the in the flight position as opposed to with the wings all tucked under the under the elytra and so on. It's, I just think it's yeah. it's an it's easy way. To... Point. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. We have a second uh, question. Uh, technical question about the frames per second and by from Christy Dubois. Um, Christy, if you um, have any additional questions about that? Uh, maybe we could chat about it at the, at the end. Um, but it sounds like uh, John may have answered your question. Um, she says it was answered. Okay, and Carolyn comments that she has uh, seen blue morphos flying in Northwest Ecuador. Um, and Bob says he has a comment on the um, morphos. So do you want to um, uh, unmute now or do you want to save it, Bob? Yeah, I go ahead and ask. Uh quickly of John. Sure. Sure. John, the, uh, I loved your morpho photographs. I have seen them in Costa Rica, that species. Uh, and another one in Mexico that's more like the one you showed in the butterfly house. But the farthest north flying morpho in North America that you can see pretty far north in Mexico is morpho polyphemus, which is not blue, but white. And uh, it, I think, would be not equal to the pseudopontia in the uh, low wing loading, but the morphos, especially that one, does have huge wings and tiny body. And here's the funny thing. Uh, you said that the pseudopontia reminds you of a piece of Kleenex flying, or you think it would. And the Mexican name for the uh, morpho polyphemus translate as pocket handkerchief butterflies. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I guess it was a comment, not a question, sorry. No, no, that's that's lovely. And, and you know, I, 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 I'd like to get hold of a specimen of, of, of that. And I was thinking too of, of that, what's what's the one that looks kind of like a, a sunset? Morpho Helena, is that right? Yes, right. It's just, just a huge, huge butterfly. That, and by the way, John, it's awfully good to see you too again. Well, friend. it's great to see you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, so thank, thank you. Question from Melanie. She's asking if body length would uh, come into play uh, in any way in flight. She says she's noticed particularly that sulfur abdomens rise above the wings as they leave flowers. Yes, yeah. And, and, and I, I'm not going to get into what happens when a butterfly uh, takes off, but it's obviously quite complex. From, from a biophysics standpoint. And, and I think that long abdomens probably do have, uh, there's, there's importance at that point uh, as, as counterbalances. The, the position of the abdomen becomes important. And I'm gonna show you a video in, in, a, in a few minutes here of a butterfly hovering. And, and you can see how the positioning of the body is important to the, to the hovering. Um, yeah, un undoubtedly important. I mean, there, there, you know, there are people who've argued that the that the little um, spots, you know, out maybe three quarters of the way out, the leading edge of dragonfly and damselfly wings, the pterostigmata, that they have an aerodynamic function, mm -hmm. uh, just because they're a little bit thicker and a little heavier. Now, that if that can matter, then certainly the the proportions of the abdomen. Uh, matter but i don't i i haven't i haven't found anything um uh, anything with any detail on you know how how that matters but good good point um and uh last question we'll take at this break um patricia bayer is saying that research is showing that bird mass and length are becoming less and wingspan greater with climate change and uh, she wonders if there's any research similar um, for butterflies? Uh, I, I don't know of any. That would be really interesting to look at. I know there's there's been some. The only thing that, that I can say that relates to it is that there's some work on wing shape differences uh, among different populations of monarchs, especially comparing um, uh, migratory and non-migratory monarchs. And there are some wing shape differences. I don't know if Bob knows that paper. If anyone's interested, you can always email me and I can find it. That's very suggestive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, why don't we press on then? Thank you for your Alrighty. question. Thank, thanks, for the, thanks for the question.
All right, well, let, let's have a look at another one. So, so here's, um, here's the common wood nymph, Circeona pigala. And this is, this is what they look like where, where I live. I, I realize they, they look quite different in other parts of the range. This is, uh, if, if you were to just take the outline, this thing looks an awful lot like that clouded sulfur. It's got, and again, it's, you know, sort of average wing loading, average um, aspect ratio, but a, a very different flight style. And, um, and I think, you know, those of us who spend a lot of time watching butterflies, you, you know intuitively that there's something different going on. Uh, so here, here's, here's this butterfly. It's flying over some grasslands in Southern Alberta. And it'll give a wing beater. And look at that. It just claps the wings above the, the body. The wings are, are clapped together and it just keeps them there. And, and it, I'll let it, this play a couple of times. And so, you know, it's intermittently closed winged. Uh, fascinating. Now in birds, you, you, a lot of birds do that too. They tuck the wings into the body and, and ornithologists call it intermittent bounding, which is kind of a weird word for, for, for something you do in the middle of the air. I think bounding should be more of a, a jump based term, but these butterflies, are, are not only intermittently closed wings, they're also uh, technically intermittently ballistic. There, there's no, there's no, um, there are no physical forces acting on them other than, uh, you know, gravity and drag. So, so it, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a, a rock coming out of a, out, out of a slingshot, a weird shaped rock at, at that. But there, what, what an interesting flight stunt. And, and, and why, why do they do that? There's you know, suggestions for birds that it might be an energy saving flight uh, mode, that, uh, that flapping continuously takes more energy than, uh, than putting your wings together for, for a, a little bit in between your, your bouts of flapping. And that makes good sense to me. I mean, certainly, you know, anyone who rides a bicycle, you know that, you know, you, you don't have to keep pedaling uh, to keep going. It's, it's kind of nice to take a little break between pedaling cycles. So there's, there's a common wooden. Um, and that, to be honest, of course, that, this wasn't a, too much of a surprise because they do it slowly enough that you can see it, uh, or at least you can, you can uh, intuit it with the, with the naked eye. But let's let's look at at uh, at this skipper. So we're back to the to the silver spotted skipper, um, and and a very uh, high wing loading critter. Now this is this happens fast, so we'll have to watch it a couple of times. The, the skipper is on the on the right side. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to aim a camera. You you can't you just can't look through the camera and aim it. It's I'm. I'm usually having the, the lens wide angle and just sort of following the butterfly with my hand. But you'll notice that that skipper is doing the same thing. It's, it's clapping the wings above the back and, uh, and having short bursts of, uh, of ballistic flight um, uh, with, with uh, a couple of flaps in between. On, on the uh, left side of the screen, there's a, there's a silvery blue. And I'll just tell you right now that, that all of the blues that I've looked at are also doing this. In fact, all of the Lycenas that I've looked at are also using the intermittently closed winged flight style. So it's very, very common among butterflies. And uh, I mean, it's, it's part of what gives skippers their name. It's the skippiness is, uh, is, is created by this flight style. Um, but I, I was very surprised that, that blues do it. I, I, it never occurred to me that blues clap the wings together above the back uh, in flight uh, often. Okay, I promised you a hovering butterfly and this is actually kind of a, this is a nice video. Um, the others are a little bit hard to follow but this was taken in the, in the greenhouse. Uh, so we got a red postman, a heliconia, somebody or other. And, and you can see that it is indeed using that abdomen as, as, a, uh, 
as a, as a kind of a counterbalance. The, the body is generally uh, oriented with the head upward. There's a nice little fine spray of mist coming from the misting apparatus here. And the butterfly is, is, uh, is able to maintain its position in the air very nicely. Um, if you read the aerodynamics papers, you really come away having no idea what you're, how to interpret what you see in, in, in these videos. But for the most part, what I find is if you look at the, the, uh, the, the trailing edge of the, of the, of the wings, the, you know, the combined fore and hind wings, and you sort of draw a line perpendicular to that, that's kind of where the, where the, uh, where the, the thrust is, uh, is being directed. So you can, you can see that directing those wings downward is, um, is what allows it to hover. It's, it's, it's really quite beautiful to watch. And I, I, you know, it's not easy to see in this butterfly. It's, it would be easier on, on some of the videos that have been posted online of, of, uh, uh, of other butterflies, but sometimes you'll see these, this is really blew my mind. A butterfly, before it makes a change of direction, sometimes it'll look in that direction. It'll actually turn its head and then orient the rest of the body in, in just this microsecond. Beautiful to watch. How about swallowtails? Uh, well, swallowtails are, are doing, you know, they have yet another uh, flight mode and it's more of a flap and glide flight mode. Uh, and again, you know, they're, they're big enough and slow enough that, that this probably won't surprise you. But here's, here's a, a Papilio canadensis, the Canadian tiger swallowtail, with a nice flap and glide flight. And, uh, and there's, you know, the wind is coming from the right to the left here. So it's also uh, benefiting from a bit of a, a, a headwind. Um, but rather than, you know, between flaps, or, or groups of flaps, rather than put the wings right above the back, it is, uh, it's engaging in a, in a glide with the wings, you know, reasonably close to, to flat with a little bit of an upward uh, dihedral, uh, as we call it. And, and most of the swallowtails I've, I've looked at are doing something like that. So there's yet another uh, mode of flight. Uh, painted lady, um, painted ladies, they'll do a lot of different things in flight. They'll, they'll do sustained flapping, uh, especially when they're migrating low to the ground. And I'm sure many of you have seen that. They will also, um, they'll also do uh, flap and glide. They don't do intermittent closed wings, but they, they occasionally do what I'm calling a long sailing glide. So here's, here's one coming into a neighbor's garden down the street. And this long sail with, with beautiful control. I mean, it's just a perfectly controlled glide, um, you know, uh, dealing with little, little wind, uh, you know, air currents, eddies and so on. That's at least a 10 meter glide with, without a flap. Uh, just beautiful to watch. Um, and, and you, you know, you'll, again, I, I, I didn't, Coach any any videos from YouTube, but uh, but if you search um, for the uh, Butan Glory butterfly, uh, Butanitis litterdale, I think is its name. Uh, there's a, just a remarkable glide on one of the videos uh, available for that species. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was also interested. Uh, you know, to, to, to see how, how really beat up butterflies fly. And I don't have a good slow motion video of one, but you know, here, here's what a painted lady looks like when it gets all the way to Edmonton from, from wherever it started in, in Mexico, presumably. Uh, there's not much butterfly left. Uh, this, this slide is in here to remind me to tell you that butterflies are what, um, what biomechanics people call four wing flyers. So, so what's really important to butterfly flight is the, is the forewing, not so much the hindwing, the forewing, and especially the leading edge of the forewing. So that's where the wing veins are, are, are most heavily um, uh, strengthened, sclerotized. 
And, and that's how a butterfly like this can keep flying, even though uh, much, of the, uh, much of the rest of the wing surface is all, uh, all chewed up. There are insects that are hind wing flyers. Beetles are hind wing flyers. The, the elite would just, just stick out to the sides. Grasshoppers are hind wing flyers, but butterflies and moths are for the most part four wing flyers. Uh, monarchs, um, it's a long distant migrant. Uh, it also soars. I, I think it's really quite interesting I should have pointed this out on the painted lady. Look, look at the uh, at the shape of the wing tips of the monarch. They're just a little bit sort of extended, hooked, you know, whatever you want to say. Um, and and go back to the painted lady. Yeah, you know, it's a similar style. I think there's something going on with these long distance butterflies, at least of a certain size. Not all long distance butterflies show this, but but there's something about that four wing tip shape that seems uh, that seems important. Um, does it does it uh, 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 distribute the wingtip vortex? Maybe I don't know. I mean, that's the sort of thing that that some someone in a you know in an engineering capacity is going to work out. But I think that wingtip shape is 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 important for these uh, for these butterflies and 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 the soaring. I'm, I'm so glad. Um, uh, to be able to tell this story with, with Bob here, because Bob, Bob and I saw this together. The, the best example I ever saw of butterflies soaring was in, in uh, at Nuevo Leon in Northeastern Mexico. And we're up in the mountains and there are all these uh, monarchs uh, on migration heading, heading south. And, 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 and looking up, we noticed that there were a whole group of us, it wasn't just me and Bob, uh, we noticed that they were they were they were soaring. They were soaring like hawks or or vultures. They were soaring on the thermals. They were spiraling upward, and uh, and and many of us laid down on the road. It was kind of a semi-abandoned uh, dirt road in the mountains. We laid down on the road and just looked up with our binoculars, and and uh, and I remember seeing one that was much higher than the other. So I refocused the binoculars. And I realized, oh, that's not that's not a monarch, that's a zone-tailed hawk. The flight style was so. And you remember this, Bob? The flight style was so similar uh, between the the monarchs and 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 the hawk that you know you, you just didn't didn't notice the difference until until you uh, you know recognized it with the binocular. And and a zone-tailed hawk that much higher than a monarch takes up about the same amount of space on your retina. Um, Soaring is is another flight mode, of course, and there's different types of soaring. I mean, that's that's uh, um, thermal soaring. Um, there, there's also um, slope soaring. So you know how 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 wind when it hits a, a ridge or or or, uh, or even a, an ocean uh, oceanic wave, it, it it there's an there's an updraft, and and many butterflies will ride those updrafts. Uh, many of the hilltopping butterflies. Um, I haven't quite completely convinced myself that I've that I've um, uh, recorded that, so I'm not going to show you an example. But uh, but it's known for many butterflies, including acreid butterflies uh, uh, in the old world. We don't have anything that that soars over the ocean like a, like an albatross, unfortunately, in the butterfly world. Here's another cool one. This is. Uh, uh, this is a tropical uh, orange tip ebomia, and, and uh, they had some, some uh, beautiful examples at the greenhouse. And I love the way this butterfly, when it, um, when it glides, it doesn't, it doesn't put the wings together above the back. It doesn't hold them out like a swallowtail. It holds them at about, um, you know, a 90 degree angle to one another and it vibrates them slightly. So it, so it seems to have a kind of <clears throat> semi-powered uh, high dihedral glide. That's the only species I found with that, uh, with that, uh, that ability. And you notice it's also a bit chewed up on the hind wing as well. Are you, can you see that? I hope you can see that. Uh, here, here's uh, uh, Graphium agamemnon. I can't remember the 
the, uh, the typical English name for this one, but very powerful body, <clears throat> nice, uh, uh, nice looking wings. I mean, you, you, you almost know before you, uh, before you watch it that it's going to be a very able flyer. And look at the control this thing has in the air. It's just, uh, it's just an astonishing butterfly to watch. Powerful and, and very maneuverable. And, and able to do you know, everything from sustained flight to, to uh, flap and glide to, to hovering. I, it, it does come back. It, it uh, left the frame for a second there. Or not a second, a very small fraction of a second. Remember, we're going at, at one-tenth here. I, I really quite like uh, like watching these things. And and you know back to butterflies with oddball wing shapes. Um, when I found out about these, I I, I definitely had to uh, track down a specimen and uh, and measure it. Mandrusa pani is an Asian swallowtail, and look at those wing tips. <clears throat> yeah. There, there's really no other butterfly with wingtips like that. I looked at that and, and also noticed, pardon me, that the leading edge of the wings has a tremendous curvature to it. Like a lot of butterflies, the leading edge is much more straight across, but this thing has this huge curvature. And, and I have no evidence for this, but just looking at that, the first thing that comes to mind is they must be trying to manage those vortices along, along the, the leading edge of the wing and, and at the wing tip, reducing those vortices, reducing the drag, allowing the butterfly to have an even swifter, more powerful flight. I, uh, I was talking to my friend, uh, Dave Laurie, some of you know Dave Laurie, and, and he had one in his collection. I said, hey, Dave, you, you've got a man drew a pan eye. And he goes, oh yeah. That was, that was not easy. I said, well, I, I really want to know what, what its flight style was like. And he said it was the fastest butterfly he ever encountered in his life. He was, uh, he was in, uh, I can't remember where in Southeast Asia, but he said there was, there was a, a partly treed ridge and he would just stand on the ridge and this thing would come by like a bullet and, and he got one swing with the net. And if he missed, well, there's no second swing. It's just simply gone. It's just unbelievably fast. So there's a really interesting butterfly with, with a, I'm gonna call it unique. I, I just don't know of anything that, that comes close. I'll show you some things that are reminiscent, but not, not, um, <clears throat> not really uh, the same wing shape. Here, here's, uh, here's a Caraxes, you know, very, uh, it's a big genus in, in the old world. And um, uh, again, you know, look at, look at that extreme curvature of, of the leading edge of the four wings, a little bit of a hook on the wing tip, um, a big heavy body. These are, these are, you know, well known as powerful flyers. Uh, here's a, here's a crazy thing, uh, Cenophlebia, um, uh, South American. Uh, you know, I, I, I first looked at that and said, well, I, I don't know how well that would work aerodynamically. Uh, and, the, and the wing shape is very bizarre. When, when you flip it over, it's quite obvious what's going on. It's a, it's a leaf mimic. And so, so the wing tip is, is, the, is the petiole of the leaf. <clears throat> but but, uh, but uh, it would be really quite fun to, to watch one of those fly in slow motion as well. Oh, I, I can also point on this, this picture that with many butterflies, the, uh, the hind wings do kind of wrap around the abdomen. So you've got a continuous aerodynamic surface on the, on the underside of the butterfly. The abdomen isn't sort of sticking out and, uh, and, and causing any drag of its own. It's, nice, it's a nice sort of continuous surface. Some of, some of the swallowtails, in, especially in Asia, are so oddly shaped. Uh, People have suggested that the tails of, swallow, of swallowtails that do have tails, because not all do, uh, that they have an aerodynamic function to, to, uh, to break up the, the eddy currents coming off the wings. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I haven't seen any sort of convincing uh, evidence for that. Uh, makes more sense to me that they might be anti-predator. 
um, uh, devices. But this one's really interesting because there's not much of a hind angle on the forewing. I mean, that's almost, you know, that's almost a continuous curve. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, sh I should have thrown in a, a picture of, uh, there are a couple of species of bird wings that, that have no discernible angle on the forewing at all. And when you watch uh, videos of them flying, those forewings are really operating quite separately from the hind wings. The, the butterfly wings are not tightly coupled the way they are in, in some uh, moths and other insects. But, um, but with, these, with these butterflies, they're not coupled at all. And then Lampropka, another, another ridiculously weirdly shaped uh, uh, swallowtail from Asia. And, and again, you can go online and find videos of these things. And they're especially neat to watch while they're, while they're mud puddling and, 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 they, and they quiver the wings and those, and those tails kind of, uh, uh, they're like streamers uh, quivering out behind the butterflies. Visually just astonishingly uh, neat to watch. If, uh, if, if you're interested in, in the technical end, uh, and as I say, I, I'm not claiming to be a technical expert here, but the, uh, the book that I was uh, directed toward by, by a friend in, in the engineering faculty here was this one, <clears throat> The Simple Science of Flight from Insects to Jumbo Jets by Hank Ten Tenekees. And you can see it's pretty darn cheap. You can get a copy for $4.39 and it'll keep you busy for some time. Um, and it's and it's well written and, and well illustrated, so I can certainly recommend that as as a uh, as a as a starting point. And and I'll finish up here um, just by by kind of bringing our attention back to the question, you know, why bother? Why 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 study this? Why why try to classify butterfly flight? And I think I think part of it is is for field identification. You know, if if uh, if we're if we have all of these terms in the field guides for butterfly flight style, it would be kind of nice if if we were to think it through and maybe have some shared terms so that we could we could uh, more easily recognize these uh, these flight characteristics. I think it, for me at least, it really enhances my appreciation of butterflies. I, I watch them differently than I than I did before I started um, exploring this. And I also think that um, that it's important for um, uh, people like me, and, and I assume people like you, people who have a, you know a naturalist sensibility, to to balance all the studies that are done by by people in biomechanics and engineering with some comparative biology, with with a uh, with a desire to look at the broad diversity of butterflies and and to ask questions about you know how many different ways is it possible to fly as a butterfly it's it's certainly not not one and uh, and heaven forbid anyone ever think that butterflies just flutter they do so much more than fluttering and uh, you know what i think i think i'll stop with that and uh, and thank you very much for your attention Okay, thank you so much, John. Uh, this is really lovely. I'd like to go through the questions that people took the trouble to put into the chat first, and then we'll open it up for um, uh, for discussion. Um, Gary Bernard um, sa says um, he notes that most of the butterflies you've shown are large. Have you considered the flight of tiny butterflies like uh, Lysenides and um, Raphidium uh, sudafea? Yeah, I, I thank, thanks for that. I the, the reason I didn't show you many examples is because the videos are so crappy. Um, but, but yes, I, I've looked at a lot of Lycenas, a, a lot of different blues, or at least, you know, as many as I can find around my neck of the woods. Um, a lot of uh, uh, grass skippers, you know, the Hesperiine skippers, um, and, and, and Physiotes, the, the Crescents as well. And so, so you know, they, they follow the, the same general patterns that, I, that I've been describing here, the, 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 uh, the blues and the skippers use the intermittent ballistic um, flight style. The, uh, the crescents are probably some of the smallest gliding organisms on, on the planet. I can't think of anything smaller than a, than a small Physiotes that achieves a glide, but they do. 
um, yeah, so the little ones are interesting too. Okay, um, the comment from several people about the common uh, wood nymph um, suggesting that the flight style um, may be an anti-predator uh, behavior since it um, uh, makes their flight um, uh, erratic and unpredictable as well. But it shows those spots when the wings are up. I, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, ener energetics and anti-predator, and you know, in, in one assumes that uh, that there is not one single function for any any attribute of an organism in, in nature that, that often multiple functions uh, coincide. So so uh, and yeah, and if anyone has ever swung a net at, at one of those butterflies, you know how remarkably good they are at not winding up in your net. Right. It, it made me think too of that um, Cenophlebia that you were talking about that also um, used, um, in this case, camouflage um, uh, on the underside. So that, that was interesting. Um, let's see. Um, Ann Lipkin was curious about how much the weather conditions of the day might affect flight style, humidity, um, temperature, wind, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably true. I don't know the exact an answer, but, but you know, my guess would be that, that there's a lot more sustained flapping on a windy day, just, just because gliding is a lot, you know, a lot less efficient or a, a lot less effective, I should say. Um, yeah, very, very, very good question. Very good question. And I don't know if, if, I mean, butterflies typically warm up to, to their, you know, activity temperature and then, then go about their business. But are, are there flight modes that are more difficult to achieve before you reach that uh, 30 degrees or thereabouts where most butterflies remain active? 30 cents, uh, centigrade, uh, centigrade. You know what I'm saying, C. <laughs> I think we do. Uh, David Stone had a question about um, uh, butterflies that are in constant fluttering motion and asking whether that's expensive energy wise and wondering if there's a relationship between such high energy flight and body weight um, with, um, you know, uh, fatter butterflies being more inclined to that type of flight. Yeah, I, if, if that relationship exists, I haven't seen it, but that's a, that's a question that I'm kind of curious about too. It's, it's, that's a very, you know, and, and I mean, a good example example is that comparison of the of the clouded sulfur and the, and the common wood nymph with very similar wing shapes and, and, and body weights and, and, and you know they plot on that that graph right like close to one another and yet they have completely different uh, typical flight styles so not sure but but it's you know it I think it's pretty difficult to imagine how it wouldn't be energetically expensive to continually flap and right. to them, you know, at, at their body size, and, and uh, air is not as flimsy as it is to us. I mean, it's a pretty thick, um, uh, it's, it's a medium that, that, that you have to work your way through. Yeah, that makes sense. I hadn't ever thought about that, but it probably is a little bit more like swimming, isn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. not quite as, as, as but, right. I, you know, still watching that morpho, it, 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 it looks a lot more like a manta ray to me than it does like some flat. Yes. Oh, yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. David Droppers has a question about um, uh, about speed. He says, if M uh, Payeni is so fast, how do we account for the speed of the mega Um Different routes to the same result, possibly? Oh, oh, yeah. When, when, wouldn't the uh, yeah the the the, uh, the giant skippers wouldn't wouldn't those be interesting to to look at on the graph? I mean, they they must. Some of them have such incredibly heavy bodies. I I I, I just think they're that that the that the the mega the uh, thymines are, are are just using a, a they're just brute force flyers, just putting a lot of muscle into it would be my guess. Um, Carl uh, Barantine says, uh, thinking about diurnal moths versus butterflies and wondering if there are any differences. 
Yeah, I, I, I've, I've thought a little bit about that. I actually, I'd be interested in your opinion too. I, 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 I remember being in a, I was getting my, my vehicle serviced in one of those drive-through places and, and there was something fluttering around in, in the inside of the building going up to the mercury vapor lights. And I honestly couldn't tell whether I was looking at a, at a big uh, geometrid like a, like a Campea or whether I was looking at a, at a, a Pieris. Uh, a, a cabbage white, uh, and so I, I started. You know, when I get a, a big geo in the in the moth trap, I'd, I'd let it go and, and watch it, and they certainly looked very butterfly ish to me. Um, May I add a comment, John? Yeah, please. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, not all moths have this, but with many moths, it's a completely different ball game how they fly from butterflies, because moths have evolved and possess something called a frenulum. What's the other half of it called? I forget, but it's a hook and eye between the forewing and the hindwing that enables the two wings to be used as a common airfoil. Only one butterfly in the world possesses this. And that is a species of Australian skipper that has been thought to be basal to um, butterflies from moths, although I don't think that's considered true anymore based on the DNA. It was a good story. But in any case, one butterfly is the frenulum. Many, many moths have the frenulum that causes their flight to be a whole different ball of wax, a whole different show from how butterflies do it. Yeah, good, good, good point, Bob. And, and the, yeah, the frenulum is, is an actual uh, uh, hook. Uh, system with butterflies it's it's been referred to as an amplexiform coupling sulcus or some such thing and it there's you know it's it's loosey-goosey it, it comes right. it comes apart pretty easy uh with with uh you know sufficient uh physical pressure but yeah, yeah well, I, I often wonder why why butterflies seem to be able to to land under control and so many moths crash land. I don't know if that's a behavioral thing or an aerodynamic thing, but that's that's one thing that comes to mind too. I wonder if they might use their hind wings a little bit more, a little more strategically than a lot of uh, front wing flyers do. And, and there's, a, there's a strange genus of, I, I can't even remember where it's from, maybe it's South America, dysmorphia. Do any of you know that with much larger hind wings than the, than the fore wings? Mm -hmm. I wonder how they fly. They look like grasshoppers. And I wonder yeah. maybe they yeah. don't. Carolyn uh, wants to know if, um, if any of your programs are available on the streaming services. Oh, you know what? Not, not, not yet, uh, but, but thank you for asking. Uh, year, years ago, when, when we finished the show, my, my, mother who was then in her 80s she said well why don't you you know why don't you so sell dvds and i said well you know the production company was bought out and you know they're not interested and she said well why don't you do it yourself i said i'd have to get the rights and then i have to fill the orders and it would be tough so she said well why don't i do it so my mother for years uh, she she got the rights she she was making the cds in the back bedroom you know and 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 and, and it was really fun and so and she's she's still with us. She's she's ninety two, and 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 uh, and she said, "Don't you go streaming that stuff." <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's now my son who, who 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 sells the DVDs, and almost everybody who buys a DVD says, "You know, you, it's it's uh, times have moved on. You should be streaming <laughs> this." And we say, "No, no, you don't want to go against you know Granny's wishes here." So. <laughs> That's so great. David Wilde published a site um, that's uh, www.acornthenaturenet.net, and he says yeah, that's, that's for the series. Yeah, it's and you, and you'll know right away when you see it that it's a that it's an old website. But that'll that'll link you up with my my son Jesse. <laughs> oh, to get the DVDs. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, uh, so Christy DeBoss, she she loves your videos on YouTube, so <laughs> you're very popular. I do want to mention that um, David Wilde shared a link with um, with us in the chat about a study just out of UBC showing the climate change um, effects on whites. 
So um, it's, uh, it's at 6.46 p.m. if you're looking for it, John. Um, so I, Carolyn, I don't know if you are able to capture that and make it available. You're probably muted. I'm muted, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I can try. What, okay. Where is that? What, it's what at, that? Um, the, in the chat, it's at the time uh, stamp of 6.46. Oh, okay. David Wilde. David Wilde. Okay, I'll look for it. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, let me see. Um, okay, I think we're good. So, uh, oh, so, so I got that, I got that. Um, so open discussion, so you're free to um, uh, unmute. Uh, I know John uh, Pelham had um, a question or a comment. Could I have a moment of your time, Brother John? Uh, once again, you have brought us to a new understanding. It was like in lineage. Uh, we had a presentation earlier about, you know, the uh, wings being alive, right? And how these wing veins aren't just support structures, they're actually supply structures. Uh, your your uh, presentation tonight was an elegant expansion on that and, and, and in other directions as well. And then the conversations got to uh, the, uh, the issue of, well, wings are all kinds of things. And you talked about surface uh, area uh, to mass relationships. And we uh, mm -hmm. talked about like moths and butterflies and diurnal versus nocturnal. By the way, moths crash because they fly at night. They can't see stuff. <laughs> uh, so like the deal is that um, I think it's so pertinent that the wings have this, you know, really wide, you know, um, broad base for, you know, looking at them, you know, they're alive. You know, their structural functions, you know, enabling flight, which is an incredible part of lepidopteran biology. And then in the end, uh, butterfly wings are especially interesting because they're diurnal and uh, they share with their, you know, their brothers, the diurnal moths, the bright coloration. And they also share in, uh, you know, some of the aspects of, of how they're, you know, um, uh, arrayed or are, are, are adorned. Uh, you know, they're, you know, could be cryptic, you know, uh, they can be colorful, uh, they can be, you know, uh, you know, aposematic as a product of being colorful, they can be um, mimetic, you know, and, um, and, and then they can be confusing taxonomically, which I always enjoy. Uh, one thing about that, though, is that they're deceptive. They're not what they appear to be. And you brought that home again tonight. They're always, they're so much more than what they appear to be. So uh, thanks again, bro. I like that a lot. Thank you. And it, it, it's, it's just, it's really fun just to hear your voice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I appreciate those comments. You know, John, John fills a function that we don't see much on this side of the Atlantic, but in Great Britain, it's very common for at the end of a, a special talk like this, for someone to give what's called an appreciation, in which they kind of sum things up make a couple of qualitative comments, maybe a little light disputation sometimes, uh, but generally speaking, it's an appreciation of the speaker uh, with a, a fine summary of what they do. And John Pelham's not the only person I know who does it over here. So that's beautiful. beautiful. Really beautiful. Make, uh, one comment on uh, monarchs, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> well, why are you laughing, John? I can't imagine why I'm laughing. <laughs> That I, that I have to talk about bloody monarchs, right? Um, thing, uh, when you have, and John, that was one of the great days of our lives, was it not? Lying there at the base of the Sierra Madre Oriental, watching the monarchs spiral up and then glide along down to the south from there. But when you get up on a thermal, I wrote about this quite a bit in Chasing Monarchs, you can watch them do it. You can watch them until they go out of sight just like a beauty of hawk. And then what happens? Then they've got to glide. And one of the reasons is that monarchs are able to travel not only hundreds, but sometimes thousands of kilometers, the same butterfly, and come out at the other end in decent shape, is that they're masters of gliding, of the descent from flight. Now you showed the, the wonderful glide of the painted lady, which is related, and then the, the short descent of the wood nymph. But monarchs can, they'll, they'll go up for thousands of feet and then descend for many hundreds of feet. They have a very strong glide ratio. And the glide ratio is everything. 
how far can you glide before you have to come down and get nectar again? And monarchs do it very well. And one of the most interesting facts about this was found by David Gibault, who also flew with the monarchs in, uh, in glider airplanes, but studied their, their biodynamics. And he found that the monarchs actually vary their glide ratio based on how fat they get from nectar because they're putting fat on all the way south. They're raising their weight in their abdomen, which shifts their center of gravity backwards, which of course affects the angle of attack of the wings. And so in order to preserve their glide ratio, they have to take on ballast of water, which they do. And they fill their crop with water as the abdomen gets heavier, they take on more water as ballast to alter their glide ratio uh, more exquisitely for the long, long glide back down again. And that's the only way they get that far in such condition. I thought that was one of the uh, most well-tuned evolutionary traits I've heard about in a very long time. My goodness, that, that's, that's fantastic. And I think that your, um, your comments on the wingtips and like so many of your other comments, John, you're good at doing this because you're so perceptive. Anybody who's heard John sing <laughs> and, 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 and uh, do his one man stand, which he pretty much does, knows how quick he is on his toes. Well, your eyes are too. You're very perceptive. And you've, you've noted, I think, some very important things about the falcate or drawn out, or as the old books say, the produced shape. Of the wingtips, right? Yeah, yeah. Those. yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to convince my engineering buddy to to look at that. You know, in in, in wind tunnels with all the precision equipment that they that they've got available. I don't, I don't think I've convinced him yet, but some someone's got to look at that. I think. Yeah, the and, and So there's all this interest in in, in uh, not to take away from what you just said, because Bob, that's really super interesting. It may also made me think about the question earlier about about what butterflies do at different temperatures. I imagine when you when you leave a thermal, it's probably not that warm up there, you know, between thermals. So so gliding is maybe the, the, the style of flight that's easiest to to pull off in, at the cold body temperature. But but what was what was I gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say there's all this interest among uh, engineering types in robotic butterflies. Mm -hmm. And you know, and of course much of it funded uh, from military money. For, for nefarious reasons. But uh, yeah, they, there's a lot of progress being made on, on robotic butterfly flight, but I haven't seen any of them with that. I, and I like that term produced, the produced wing shape or wingtip shape. So um, Allison Center had a, a comment. Allison, would you be willing, be willing to unmute it? Uh, her question is about um, moth, or her comment is about uh, moth uh, flight strategies. Allison? Yes, I was reminded recently that October is bat month and uh, how bats fly is a whole nother topic, but I was thinking about moths, some of the adaptations that bats and moths have come up with to, for the bat to catch the moth and for the moth to avoid being caught. And one of them is when the moth senses the bat trying to detect it, it drops immediately. And so it's no longer where the bat expects it to be. And I was thinking the adaptation to just take a drop like that would be pretty interesting. I don't know what it is, but I was just thinking it would be interesting to see what dynamic that, that was. Yeah, and, and adding, adding the, the, the element of, of, of acoustics and, and, and ultrasonic sound, if, if you, if you haven't done this, you have to uh, wait till you see a bunch of moths around a light and then jingle your keys. And, and the, your keys produce a lot of ultrasonic sound and, and the moths with, with good hearing will, will spiral downward. Mm. Oh, oh. Well, go ahead. Uh, one of the bats, we have a sensitive species of bat here in Oregon, the Townsend's big-eared bat and its uh, counter adaptation is to be very quiet, so you can't pick it up on your bat detector software very well because they have a much quieter ultrasonic sound to try to get around the bat 
or the moth's ability to detect it. That's, that's cool. Moths are thought to have seen, Sorry? Sorry, moths are thought to have evolved ears at least seven different times. Seven mm -hmm. different times, seven different points in moth evolution, at least that, different parts of their body. And at least at least one or two, more than that, probably in the geometric, they have also evolved the ability to project sound to jam the sonar of bats. So it gets really complicated. And I remember being up at Timberline Lodge and watching all the bats and all the moths. And you think about bats having locked on like Top Gun and that moth is curtains. It's not like that. The, the bats only connect about one out of every five or six or 10 times. It's, it's a great evolutionary race between the two. So Carl, I was wondering if you had um, observed some of um, some uh, prey, um, well, like she was talking about the jingling of the keys. Have you observed um, moths uh, adjusting their behavior? Um, well, I, uh, I hang out on the internet with some interesting people, as you can well imagine. And uh, Forest Wake University's turned out a number of uh, graduates that have studied moth bat behavior. Uh, one of those was uh, Becky Simmons, who ended up at the University of North Dakota, and, but she was primarily interested in uh, molecular biology. And uh, but uh, but yes, there's a whole body of literature on that. I'm very interested in bats here because when I fire up my lights, <laughs> especially in the month of September, oh my gosh, it's about the time the swallows are passing through during the day. I think the bats are passing through too. And uh, I'm, I could be wrong, but it seems like the density of bats around my light increases tenfold. And uh, uh, for some reason or another in uh, late August, mid September. And uh, I, I just, I worry about those poor moths so much. <laughs> I'm not out there swinging a bat or anything like that. Anna, but uh, uh, I, I am intrigued. Um, uh, Jerry Fowski, one of my mentors in North Dakota at NDSU, uh, tells stories of, of, of watching bats around mercury vapor light and then uh, tallying what taxa he collects uh, that actually make it all the way down the sheet. And he, he claims that he can tell uh, which, which moths are, are, are listening to, to the bats and which ones are not uh, uh, based on uh, what he sees above and what he actually ends up with uh, in his capture uh, traps at the end of the day. Uh, hey, night. Carl, what, what species of bat were you swinging? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Something out of merch, I suppose. <laughs> Funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, and they're so fast. I, I cannot believe how bats, how fast the bats are. You know, I, in, in the wilderness area of North Dakota, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, National Park, I would take students out for night hikes uh, around the lights, and we'd throw a pebble you know, up in the air around the light and watch the bats follow it almost to the ground, you know, and the students would be absolutely amazed. But that's nothing, nothing like the bats cruising by a mercury vapor light. They are so fast. I, I can't even imagine a, a, any moth standing a chance against a bat. Um, I, you know, it's amazing to me. I had no idea that bats were so fast until I stood out and watched them one night. And I, I would like to have a strobe light firing and then uh, set up a, a camera so that I could actually record some of this behavior like they do at, say, uh, at, at uh, Wake Forest College, where they do a lot of slow motion photography. So um, Christy Dubois uh, mentions she, she can't unmute because her mic is dead, but she says that uh, many bats migrate in August and September. So it sounds like <laughs> that's what you're observing, Carl. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't see it really in those numbers any other time. She wants to come to your house with her bat detector. 
Yeah, we would, we, Christy, we'd give presentations at Pearl River State Park and, and Becky had a bat detector. It was fun because we'd catch moths and we'd hold them by the wings and she would, she would, she would uh, show people, uh, make the sound audible for the, the people that came for the presentations. You know, it was amazing. Uh, uh, I said, how much does that cost? Because I want one of those. I think it was like 200 bucks or something like that. I thought, no, I'm a poor professor. Or I couldn't afford anything like that. You'd have to write an NSF grant for something like that, I suppose. <laughs> there was someone selling bat detectors for something like 50 bucks. They, 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 he made them inside uh, garage door opener uh, boxes. And they, they were broad spectrum, but still still functional. I wonder if that guy's still in, in business. Oh, can I just add it? Uh, uh, you know, living where I do, we're, we're kind of aware of the fact that the bat fauna is is either changing or or about to change. Uh, with with a warmer climate, we now have red bats where I live. We never had red bats before, and in in the foreseeable future, we'll also see a decrease in the little brown bats and the other myotis bats because of of white nose syndrome, which is an emerging bat disease. It'd be very interesting. I'm I'm sure someone has thought about this. It'd be very interesting to see how the moth fauna might change with the change in 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 the bat faunas, mm -hmm. and hopefully, you know, hopefully the the uh, the white nose uh, syndrome will will uh, will eventually um, you know give way, and we'll have resistant uh, bats. But uh, but it's quite it's good. There's going to be huge changes to the to the bat faunas everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, in some places have already experienced it. Mm -hmm. I, I I haven't heard any good news about the white nose syndrome just that, that it's marching west. Um, is is there evidence of? Um, I, I think there are some some populations of bats that seem to be showing some resistance. Yeah, oh, I can't remember where. Uh, Carl Carl may not feel the same way, but um, it's a relief for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, are there any other questions or comments or? One way to look at that, Carl, is that moths are very much better at what they do thanks to bats. Oh, yeah, well, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> my mom would say that. This is gonna hurt me a lot more than it's gonna hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know, uh, John Acorn, I would like to actually ask you a question. Are you still getting out and performing, because that's another big part of your persona. You know, I, I, Bob, I, I haven't been. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of out of practice. Every, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll play like one tune. I, I don't have an instrument with me now. I, <laughs> John I, I, has. I should though, but thank you, thanks. Yeah. For, and and Bob, you and I have sung together. I can't remember what. Yeah. Well, we did. We, for example, down at the Texas Butterfly Festival. Uh, you keynoted one night, I keynoted the next night, and we got together and sang the Xerxes Blue Blues. Oh, yes, that's right. You had your harmonica. And you had your wonderful little traveling guitar. You still have that beautiful traveling guitar? Oh, yeah, guitar? It's, it, it, it's, in, it's in great shape. It's about this big. It's about the size <laughs> of a ukulele, but it's a ukulele, but it's a guitar. Hmm. Well, I miss hearing you, John. You're so good. Oh, it, it's, it's nice hearing you too. And, and nice, 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 to, nice to meet your whole. Nice to meet your whole group. You know, you 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 guys have such a reputation. Oh, uh, they're okay. They're okay. Yeah, <laughs> you got a reputation. And and you know, so many, just so many great books have come from 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 your your group and your authors. It's just it's great to great to talk to people. Well, we're so happy that you are willing to join us tonight and, and to give such a wonderful presentation. Uh, lots of questions, lots of participation. Um, so people are very, very, very thrilled um, to have you join us tonight. So thank you very much, John. And speaking of books, can I give a plug for John's book, uh, Butterflies, of British, Butterflies of British Columbia in Alberta too, but uh, his Butterflies of BC book is very approachable, very helpful, beautiful book. Uh, among okay. your others, John. Thank, well, thank you for thinking of that. Go ahead, John. Oh, I, no, I had nothing to say. I was just celebrating John. You just keep on keeping on, bro. Okay.
Okay, well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time, John. So I hope everybody has a, a great evening and where our next meeting will be in November. We're still working out um, uh, exactly the speaker, but um, we hope we'll see you then. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. See you all again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, let's see, was there a comment about, did Gary still want to stay online or maybe, maybe he's left already. Okay. I think he, I think he asked, he, um, uh, he, he brought up what he wanted to in the discussion beforehand. Is that right, Bob? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. Thank well, have, thank have you, Paulette. Great... You did oh, so, you did it's, so well uh, for us. it's wonderful evening. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Okay, good night everyone. See you next month.